and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, some White House officials try to restart talks with China before the first wave of tariffs kicks in. Meantime, tech leaders are starting to speak out about the risks of a full-blown trade war. Plus, a deep dive into new energy sources. What is driving the push toward batteries and which power monopolies are under threat? And we cover the fallout after the departure of Brian Krasanich as Intel CEO. How the shakeup highlights the new demands from leadership in the Me Too era. But first to our top story, Bloomberg is reporting White House officials are trying to restart talks with China to avoid a trade war before U.S. tariffs on Chinese products take effect July 6th. The countdown is on before $34 billion in Chinese products are hit with tariffs and tech leaders are starting to speak out about the growing concerns of a full-blown trade war. Speaking at a shareholder meeting, Terry Goh, the billionaire chair of Foxconn, said the biggest challenge facing Foxconn is a U.S.-China trade war. Trade war is not about trade, but it is a tech war, and it is a manufacturing war. For more on rising global trade tensions, we are joined by Jenny Leonard with Bloomberg News in Washington. So first of all, uh, talk to us about the timeline here, given that the first wave of tariffs is expected to hit in just two weeks. Yeah, so the... the the efforts that we reported about yesterday, which a faction of the White House is trying to get the Chinese to engage in talks to maybe push down the timeline to have the tariffs go into effect, uh, seems to not, at least from from our reporting now, it seems to not have worked. We have no signs that the president is willing to back down. So the tariffs are likely to go into effect on July 6th. And we know that China is ready to retaliate with its countermeasures. Same amount, same timeline. So that, that timeline still stands, as we know so it right now. So tell us then what you have learned about you know, some officials within the administration who have been pushing for this, if unsuccessfully. So some officials um, who are from the more pro-trade wing of the White House, from the National Economic Council, have reached out to former government officials and China experts to gauge the chances of what it would take to get the Chinese vice president to come visit before the tariffs are set to hit on July 6th. Obviously, we had Liu He, uh, Chinese economic advisor here, and the talks for a potential trade deal sort of fell apart um, after Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said the trade war is on hold and then the tariffs were set to move forward. Uh, so now they're trying to up the ante and the next highest level of person that could come to Washington would be the Chinese vice president. So they were trying to see how could you get him here? How could this man meet with President Donald Trump and maybe figure out a solution that doesn't lead to tariffs? Uh, we know that the president is intent on imposing these tariffs because no one has done this before. This president is intent on doing a lot of things that no one has done before. So maybe while he's not looking to have these tariffs in place for a, a long time, he definitely wants to impose them. And so we're looking at that timeline. We're looking at next Friday investment restrictions will be imposed. Um, that's coming out of the Treasury uh, Department. Uh, and so we're definitely going to see at least the first shots fired in what is a trade war or could become one. And what do you make of the comments coming from business leaders in China? You know, we heard the head of Foxconn saying this is a tech war, a manufacturing war. And this is a company that, though based in China, mm -hmm. you know, manufactures Apple products and many other American companies' products. Right. So w I think what we're seeing here, this is this is just the beginning of many companies speaking out about this because we've kind of seen also the markets haven't really taken this seriously. I mean, the president has talked about all these tariffs and really following through on all of this stuff, but no one has really translated that into what this would mean for the economy or for individual companies. So here we are now, uh, especially with the investment restrictions coming next Friday, that will be possibly a bigger blow for both economies and, and companies on both, both uh, countries 
to uh, see what these investment restrictions will do to their businesses. And so I think the, the quote that we just saw, that's just the beginning of um, many, many, many companies speaking out because they're not being heard by this administration. There's a lot of companies that have tried over and over again to get to the White House, to get to USTR, and they just aren't being heard. And so I think this is now <laughs> what we're going to see. They're, they're complaining but have no chance of, of getting to the heart of this. All right, Jenny Lettered in Washington for Bloomberg. I know you will keep us posted. Thank you. Well, the cybersecurity firm Flashpoint released a new report this week highlighting the biggest global threats in cyberspace and what they mean for the online and real world. For more, we are joined in Washington by John Condra, director of Asia Pacific Research, who helped write this report. China obviously is, you know, uh, ground zero in many ways for, for cyber attacks and cyber attacks on the United States. Do you expect any more activity um, given these trade tensions from Chinese cyber attackers? Well, I think the, the trade relations between the U.S. and China are just one aspect of the geopolitical uh, kind of drama that is unfolding between the U.S. and China as well. I think the, the long-term geopolitical, geopolitical interests of China in uh, undermining the U.S.'s uh, military dominance in East Asia as well as its alliance system there remains the same and I think that uh, long term uh, from both an economic and a geopolitical perspective their interest in acquiring say uh, American intellectual property uh, remain uh, pretty static. Um, I think during this this time of negotiations with North Korea uh, where it does look like we might be making a little bit of progress there I think a large-scale attack uh, of some you know a scale that we haven't seen perhaps is, is rather unlikely likely, uh, both from North Korea and China. Um, but again, the long-term uh, long risks associated with these relationships remain pretty static, even though uh, we, we have been moving into an area of uh, potential detente. Right. You say, despite tentative reconciliation between the U.S. and North Korea, North Korean cyber hackers have continued their actions unabated. What do you see? Yeah, so there have been a string of attacks over the last few months tenuously linked to uh, North Korea. And as I think hopefully your viewers are aware, attribution in cyberspace is, is very difficult. It, it really requires, uh, diff uh, concrete attribution really requires information uh, not just derived from cyberspace, but from also other sources. Uh, and so it is a, it's a very uh, cat and mouse game that does require a lot of time and technical know-how. Uh, so North Korea in particular has been tenuously linked to a series of attacks in South Korea in particular to on uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, for example, as well as most recently a uh, slew of attacks uh, against uh, financial institutions, traditional financial institutions in Latin America. I want to talk a little bit about how the U.S. is responding and the U.S. has you know, mobilized a new sort of cyber offensive. Um, we had David Sanger on the show yesterday, who is the author of a new book called The Perfect Weapon, also the national security uh, correspondent for The New York Times. Take a listen to what he had to say. We have not developed the doctrine under which we would decide when we're going to use these weapons and when we're not. And we won't even talk about them in public. If you won't do that, you can't begin to set some guide rails. How well prepared, John, is the U.S. to respond, you know, not just defensively, but offensively? Absolutely. So, unfortunately, the last year or so has been rather hard on the American intelligence community, including some of our uh, most respected intelligence agencies, such as the CIA and NSA. And you've seen that with uh, various releases, unfortunately, from the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency through groups like the Shadow Brokers and, um, and WikiLeaks. So I think a lot of our offensive capabilities, and obviously I, I can't uh, speak in too much detail, but I think our offensive capabilities are considered the pinnacle uh, in this space. However, However, we have, we have taken a, a significant hit over the last few years, uh, and it, I think that uh, that will have an impact on how we respond. I, I would say, with respect to uh, David Sanger's comments a moment ago, uh, we really, as an international community, and this is not just a U.S. problem, uh, have to determine how we are going to respond to uh, these types of incidents. Uh, when is it appropriate to use force, for example, kinetic force, for example, in response to a cyber attack? When are sanctions appropriate, et cetera? These are issues that have been uh, talked about at, ad nauseum for some time, and unfortunately, there is no easy answer. And if there were, I feel like we wouldn't necessarily be in this situation. U.S. and EU-led sanctions have been tightened or extended on Russia. 
How worried do we need to continue to be about Russia, given our own midterm elections underway? Yeah, well, I, I think you bring up a good point. Unfortunately, a lot of the sanctions that have been put on Russia don't seem to have had that much of an effect. Um, both the U.S. and the EU have, imp have imposed sanctions. And But look, Vladimir Putin got reelected. The price of oil is rising again. They're currently hosting the World Cup. There is not a lot of indication that they have paid a significant price for what they uh, allegedly did during the 2016 election to manipulate our, our democracy. Um, and so I think that going forward, we're very likely to see pretty similar uh, attempts, particularly in the upcoming midterm election, at manipulating public opinion and not necessarily uh, manipulating vote counts, but doing what Russia has historically done best, which is manipulating information and people's public opinion. John Condra with Flashpoint in Washington. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank, thank you. The story we are watching, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the privacy rights of mobile phone users, saying prosecutors need a warrant to get phone location data. The court ruled Friday in favor of Timothy Ivory Carpenter, who said prosecutors violated the Constitution when they obtained four months of phone data and used it at trial to show he was near the sites of a string of armed robberies. The ruling could have a far-reaching impact. Prosecutors in most parts of the U.S. had been able to demand that data from mobile phone carriers without showing the probable cause was required to get a warrant. Coming up, Facebook's fallout from the Cambridge Analytica scandal continues to haunt them. Details on how one bank says investors should drop the social network next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. The Scandinavian bank Nordea says any money manager who is serious about ethical investing should drop Facebook. Nordea's head of sustainable finance says the social network was unresponsive to questions about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Facebook hasn't responded to a request for comment. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde joins us now from London to discuss. So, Caroline, what is Nordea's real issue here? The issue is how proactive Facebook was, the fact that it wasn't at all in their respect. They feel that they didn't get any good answers to their questions about how Facebook dealt with the whole scandal that involved Cambridge Analytica and the 87 million amounts of our data that was put into the hands of it. And so they feel that therefore they should walk the talk when it comes to sustainable investing and drop Facebook entirely, saying, really, look, even though Mark Zuckerberg said, look, I'm really sorry, he apologized, he went in front of EU and, and US politicians, that wasn't good enough, according to them. So I think this is notable coming from Nordea, although we've got to put it into perspective. The guy who manages this money, who heads up sustainable investing, Sassia Beslik, has taken some pretty controversial stands before. In fact, he quarantined, he stopped buying the shares of his own company, of own parent group, Nordea, because they at the time were being investigated for tax avoidance. Should Facebook be concerned about this, that other funds could follow? Potentially, because even though this doesn't move the needle in terms of how much money actually Nordea puts into Facebook, and when you break it all down, they only invest 6 billion euros of their more than 320 billion euros into sustainable investing, and of that, a measly 3.6 million euros was actually in Facebook. So that is hardly anything when you think of the half a trillion dollar valuation that Facebook has. So they're not going to suffer in terms of Nordea letting it go. But this is part of a movement that we see in terms of money going into sustainable investing. That's growing by about 12% per year. But also think of the responsibility that shareholders are now talking of. Larry Fink, he manages, he's the head of BlackRock, which is the biggest asset manager out there in the world. He's saying, look, it's time to hold companies to account. At the beginning of the year, he wrote a letter to all the big big companies out there and the leaders of them saying, look, you've got to be 
fully overt about your social purpose. The question is here whether Facebook actually let go of its social purpose in this whole data scandal. And many might argue actually it didn't because they still brought the world closer together. And that is their person, purpose, that is their mission. Sure, they were pretty poor with our data and they were lax with it and they've apologized, but were they really against their mission there? That's the question that sustainable investors have to ask themselves. Right, and their goal is still to make money and the shares are at their <laughs> highest point ever. They've completely rebounded and then some from, you know, where yeah. they were trading, you know, just after this scandal broke. So are they cutting off their nose to spite their face? I think this is exactly, he is, he admits it. I mean, the guy who's managing this money, Sasia Beslik, is saying, look, I, I realize this is financially painful, but I need to walk the talk, is exactly his words. So sure, the rest of the investor base seem to have shrugged it off. So they've seen that the advertisers don't seem to mind too much. The fact that the user base hasn't left them. So overall, they're sticking with them. But I, I think it's interesting to note how going forward, we continue to see Facebook react to this, the regulatory impact Impact as well. That's going to be a key question going forward for investors. Caroline Hyde for us in London. Thank you so much, Caroline. Coming up, our exclusive interview with Jet.com's new president, Simon Belsham. What he has to say about the company's strategy to win over big city grocery shoppers next. This is Bloomberg. YouTube is doing more to keep its brightest stars happy. The online video site is adding a feature that will allow content creators with more than 100,000 subscribers to sell memberships to their fans. Loyal viewers will be able to pay a monthly fee for perks like custom emojis, exclusive content, and merchandise. Almost two years ago, Walmart paid $3 billion for e-commerce startup Jet.com and its founder, Mark Lorry. He has since transformed Walmart's e-commerce operation, largely overshadowing Jet. And now Jet is back with a new strategy to win over big city grocery shoppers for Walmart. Emma Chandra spoke exclusively with Jet.com's new president, Simon Belsham, and asked how Jet.com can differentiate itself from Walmart.com. Take a listen. The Jet business has evolved to serve a more urban and affluent customer where we know that our brand really resonates uh, with customers, particularly in the large uh, coastal metropolitan areas uh, within the US. And so that's really what we've been doing to focus on that today. And we've made good progress on that path. Um, both through our assortment, we've brought on you know, local brands such as the New York Favorite Shop and the Grocery Range, which is selling a number of local um, grocery products. From a service perspective, we acquired uh, a startup um, called Parcel who will provide last minute, last mile fulfillment services for, for customers in the New York area. So we're making good progress to start to really move the business towards being a very um, urban uh, focused uh, offering for, for customers. So is it Jet.com's mission to win over the New York shopper for Walmart? Really, I think when we look at where the brand resonates, it very much is with that more urban and affluent customer. And actually, that complements a lot of Walmart's strengths you know, elsewhere in the country. And so that is absolutely our mission. We want to become an essential brand for people who live in cities. Grocery is a big focus for you here at Jet.com, and that's certainly your background at Tesco and Ocado in the UK. How do you compete with the more established online grocers? I'm talking about the likes of Fresh Direct, Amazon Fresh, slash Whole Foods, and Peapod. So I think grocery is a critical part of our business going forwards. And when I look at the US market, you know, certainly with my experience in, in operating in a number of grocery markets around the world, no one really is combining grocery and general merchandise in a, in a really seamless way for customers. And I think that's a great opportunity for, for Jet. Um, and the way that we're looking at it is to you know, build a business here uh, in New York and really um, understand the urban customer and provide a service that, that works for them. You know, for me, one of the exciting things about grocery is some people see it as quite a functional experience. I actually see it as a really emotional experience. Are you confident that there is consumer demand to do it in a very unemotional way online? I think actually uh, online can be very uh, emotionally engaging for customers and a lot of what we want to do is to really what we call rehumanize e-commerce, really put that combination of human empathy back with technology. You know, customers are looking for convenience but they're also looking for a business that they can trust that is on their side. What about costs? You mentioned last mile delivery, it's often the most expensive. How do you absorb those costs and still make a profit? 
You know, I think um, for any retailers, it's the ability to build a relationship with a customer across all of their life. And that's why, again, grocery is an important part of that offer. It's something that customers buy frequently. It's something that they trust. And on the back of that relationship, we can work with them to sell a broad range of other categories like we do today. That hasn't quite answered my question, though, about the fact that the last mile is really extremely expensive. You've got to be, you've got to find a way to pay for that somewhere else. So how do you manage those costs? I think with any retailer, it's about the combination of all of the things together. And I think when you look at the economics of it all, it really makes sense for us as a business and with a customer. As you look to implement this strategy that is focused on New York and the coastal cities, are you looking towards any other partnerships or acquisitions? So I think as a business and as Walmart as a whole, you know, we're always looking at how do we grow our business and how do we continue to innovate and whether that's through partnerships, you know, or, or you know, or M&A over time. You know, a really good example actually is we have a division within the, the team called um, Digitally Native Vertical Brands. It's run by Andy Dunn, who founded Bonobos. Um, Within that, they have a series of, of brands which you know, are digitally born and they're exclusively sold through Jet. A good example is Allswell mattresses, you know, exclusive through Jet, but really competing in the red hot mattress market. I've actually got one at my home. I can testify how comfortable they are. Um, but I think that's a good example of where we can actually partner to provide a unique assortment and really get the advantage so of being part of So we should expect Walmart. more of these? I think they're a good signal as to the direction we're going in. And finally, one topic in the news, we're talking about the escalating trade war between the US and China quite a lot here on Bloomberg. Are you concerned about the impact of tariffs for Jet.com? If you look at the website, you obviously have a number of products that are made in China. So my job is to really just build a business for our customers and really focus on the urban areas of which I know that the Jet brand resonates. And there will always be macroeconomic changes. There'll always be political changes. And as a business leader, we've just got to respond and continue to focus on doing what's right for customers. I think being part of the broader Walmart group gives us an advantage here. We can you know, really rely on the scale and purchasing of Walmart for some of our products. Um, but my job is just to keep really focused on the customer and, and lots of things will happen in the world around that. And the customer shouldn't therefore expect higher prices? You know, I think as we build, you know, the assortment for, for our customers, we can benefit from the scale of Walmart. So relatively, I think we're in a really good place. Um, and, you know, importantly, Walmart has al al already invested a lot in U.S. source products um, and U.S. jobs over the last few years. Uh, and so, again, it's something that Jet can really benefit from there as well. That was Jet.com's president, Simon Belsham, with Bloomberg's Emma Chandra. Coming up, the future of renewable energy. Demand is growing, and so are the ways we can store what powers the future. That's next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. For years, lithium-ion batteries have been found in cell phones, laptops, and smartphones. But more recent versions are, well, bigger. The electric vehicle boom has already replaced gadgets as the world's biggest source of lithium-ion battery demand. And along with this growing demand, the need to store more energy to power the world will be a necessity to compensate for the times that the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And you can read all about this and more in a new report by Bloomberg, the New Energy Outlook 2018. It's Bloomberg New Energy Finance's annual long-term economic analysis of the world's power sector out to 2050. Joining me now to discuss, Logan Goldie Scott, head of energy storage at Bloomberg NEF. Logan, thank you so much for joining us. So what is pushing this drive towards batteries and energy storage? 
Thanks. It's essentially batteries, uh, batteries have got to where they are today because of this uh, up to, uh, sort of surge in demand for electric vehicles. But what that means is that so now when we look forward, batteries become the crucial source of flexibility in the power markets. And so batteries help enable wind and solar to increase their combined share of electricity generation from 7% today globally to 50% in 2050. And we're not talking just about vehicles, we're talking about homes and corporations as well. Well, right? Exactly. So that's just stationary energy storage. So um, whether it's a sort of a, a power wall in your home, in your garage, or whether it's a large utility scale system uh, connected directly to the grid. How do the U.S. efforts in energy storage compare to China? As you know, obviously we hear so much about Tesla and what Elon Musk is doing here. You know, but obviously, you know, China has been focused on this actually for quite a while. In, indeed, it's important to differentiate between deployments and then manufacturing. In terms of deployments, the US is, uh, is, is a world leader at the moment. In manufacturing, we've seen significant strides in China that are beginning to outpace what's happening here. In order to compete on the manufacturing side, US companies will have to significantly increase their investment in scale and increase their investment in technology. Will the supply chain be an issue for them, especially given much of the supply comes from China? Um, we, we believe like we have seen supply chain constraints over the last few years, notably with lithium and cobalt, those caused prices to spike over that period. However, longer term, we do think there will be sufficient supply to meet demand. And, um, and actually, we don't see China as being sort of one of the, one of the main risks there. Um, instead, we see cobalt's uh, sort of a um, reliance um, sort of uh, on the Democratic Republic of Congo being sort of a much bigger concern for automakers and stationary storage developers Interesting. in the world. Interesting. How so? Uh, well, roughly 60% of the world's cobalt is currently sourced from the DRC, and um, this is a, um, a, a territory that has had uh, significant sort of permitting issues, uh, stability issues, and this is something that automakers repeatedly cite as a concern when they look at their supply chain. All right, I want to broaden this out a little bit and bring in two people intimately familiar with the growing need to create more energy storage, especially lithium ion batteries. We've got Michael Austin, the vice president of BYD's American Operations. BYD is one of the largest rechargeable battery manufacturers in the world. Also with us, John Zarancic, the COO of Fluence, a leading global energy storage provider. And John, I want to start with you. You know, you know, part of the surge here is because the price in batteries has gone down so much that this is now economical for consumers and corporations. How do you see batteries disrupting the current power markets, the current power monopolies? Well, I think batteries have come about in the last few years as really an alternate to some of the power plants that we would have otherwise built. Um, often we're building power plants for the reliability of the grid. And today uh, we have the opportunity to put a battery system in places for that same reliability, flexibility uh, that Logan was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, and this is a perfect complement to the kinds of renewable generation that is, is really the main driver of, of new energy. Michael, how big a driver is transportation in terms of driving battery development and growth? So I, I'd say uh, certainly EVs, electrification of uh, transportation, is the largest driver of batteries today. I think China uh, over the next every year is, uh, is consuming about 18 gigawatt hours of batteries just for buses. Uh, and they are transitioning, I think, all of their bus fleets to zero emission technologies, uh, electrifying their platforms, which kind of produces an energy agnostic platform that can use solar energy, wind air energy, coal energy, whatever the electron th they need um, is adaptable. So as they clean up their, uh, their technology, the, adapt the adaptable technology immediately uses to do energy. So China's driving that with electrification and China today I think t is produced in the first quarter more uh, over, the, over the, the time of production more EVs than all of the nations put together. So they're driving these chemistries uh, scale, manufacturing components, and spend, leverage all through, uh, through their electrified vehicles, their vehicle technology. I John, who are the biggest losers in the onslaught of batteries? Uh, well, I don't know that it's so much the losers of it. I think it's just the fact that we have an electrical infrastructure 
that we have to continue to invest in. Electricity is very fundamental to uh, economic growth everywhere in the globe. As assets age out, old power plants, old transmission lines, and things have to be replaced, what we're finding is batteries in large format systems are just a better way to rebuild that infrastructure. So we're finding batteries that go on the grid and substitute in some cases for jobs we did with transmission lines. In other cases, they substitute for jobs we did with power generators. But in all cases, they're really complementing the grid. They're making it cheaper, they're making it more reliable, and they're making it cleaner. Michael, it's not all smooth sailing ahead, though. I mean, there are some things about batteries that I understand keep you up at night. What are they? Uh, well, certainly the, if you select the wrong chemistry, there are certain chemistries that are very high energy density, but also uh, susceptible to thermal runaway. And um, certainly it keeps me up at night. Uh, if, if, the, if the industry doesn't select the correct chemistry, we could have uh, landfill nightmares in the future when we're trying to uh, uh, recycle these batteries. Um, that, that keeps me up at night. The other thing that I think really worries me is almost this tyranny of the embedded base. Uh, I do believe we're displacing industries, entire industries. Uh, the internal combustion engine technologies, uh, I believe, will be in the past. Electrified transportation is more reliable, it's more sustainable, uh, it's adaptable. And so uh, we will see uh, a lot of disruption uh, as electrified vehicles uh, gain more market share. Logan, that sounds a little scary. Sc scary or exciting, mm -hmm. depending which perspective you're coming from. How would you characterize the way Tesla fits in here and what Elon Musk is trying to do? How revolutionary is it? Or not. <laughs> I, I think if we if we look at Tesla um, as a battery manufacturer, sort of here in the United States, it currently has around 18, 19 gigawatt hours of commission capacity of the gigafactory. Now that puts it sort of on par with any battery manufacturer in the world at the moment. And it has planned to increase that over the next few years to 105 gigawatt hours a year um, of production capacity, once again here here in the US. So that, that scale is almost unparalleled, but it's, it's part of a general rush from leading manufacturers, whether they're from China, Korea, Japan, or the US, um, to sort of cement their positions here. So Tesla is at the forefront, but it's not alone. John, you know, uh, being, you know, from, uh, you know, an industry that is uh, being disrupted again and again, what do you think are the main trends that are going to shape how batteries grow and develop over the next few decades? Well, we've been in this for a little while. So we started our efforts in battery uh, energy storage on the grid about 10 years ago, and most recently just formed this joint venture affluence with Siemens and AES to take this really farther into the next level. Uh, today, we've already deployed battery systems in 16 countries around the globe. We've got some of the largest systems existing in places like Arizona, California, Hawaii, New York coming online, but other places as well, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, Japan, around the world. So I think we're recognizing the fact that uh, storage is here. It's supplied in a quantity that can replace uh, some of the traditional solutions like power plants, and it's fitting a lot of our policy goals. Um, it's cleaner, it's more compact, it fits in urban areas uh, where we can't build power plants today, and it allows our grids to be uh, flexible and take the best advantage of the renewables that, that are being built all over. So, Michael, when will my home and my car be run on batteries and every home and car? Is that, is that well, in the future? Uh, I, certainly in the future. It's one of the only sustainable uh, solutions. You know, you, if we're looking at true zero emission technologies or a, a zero emission ecosystem where you start with renewable power, and you make it relevant, firm and dispatchable to the grid. You use environmentally friendly batteries, like we were talking about, to balance and then dispatch that power and then responsibly use that power for electrified transportation or LED lighting systems in homes. That, that ecosystem, I believe, is the only sustainable ecosystem in the future. We, we can't depend on finite fuels that pollute our air and, and our water. We're, we're gonna have to turn more and more to renewable power uh, to, to be relevant. Companies that will select those will stay relevant in the future. Michael Austin of BYD, John Zaransic of Fluent, Logan Goldie-Scott of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, thank you all.
New details have emerged about the self-driving Uber that struck and killed a pedestrian in March. A new report from the Tempe, Arizona Police Department states that the safety driver was distracted and streaming a television show on their phone right before the crash. The car was in autonomous driving mode at the time. The report says the driver was watching the show The Voice on Hulu and didn't look up until half a second before the crash. Police say the crash was, quote, deemed entirely avoidable. Police submitted their findings to prosecutors, but there is no word yet on if the driver will be charged. Coming up, fintech startup Gusto processes billions of dollars in payrolls. What have they learned about the needs of the workforce? We're gonna to speak to Gusto CEO next. This is Bloomberg. A new crop of startups is trying to tackle one of the biggest headaches in the workplace, payroll and benefits like 401ks. Gusto launched in 2012 and has been building up its client base, now processing billions of dollars in payroll transactions. And the company has likely benefited from the stumble of one of its biggest competitors, Zenefits, whose CEO was ousted amidst a scandal that involved employees allegedly cheating on state compliance exams. Meantime, Gusto has been full speed ahead and they say they are listening to what the workforce wants, launching a new flexible pay feature. Josh Reeves, Gusto CEO, joins me now here in the studio. So flexible pay, employees can decide to get paid the next day if they want, whatever day they yeah. want to be paid. Why is this so significant? So most people today are paid on a two-week pay schedule, and one of the downstream effects of that is if you have rent due two days before payday, you have to go take out a loan or use credit card debt. Um, we're trying to basically redo that, undo that, and say people should get paid when they want. So if you work seven days, you should get paid for those seven days of work. And so that's possible at Gusto because we're the payroll system. So employees on Gusto can literally go in and choose to get paid tomorrow. And then that's possible without the employer debit cycle changing at all. How much back-end work does that involve? So we've been building the product, the system now, for five, six years. It's really based on a lot of that work and effort. Our ability to process tens of billions of dollars of payroll is what makes this possible. I'm curious how, you know, it sounds great, but in practice, how many employees are actually going to take advantage of this? So employers in America, eight out of ten say that their employees' personal finances affect their work performance. And you have literally 12 million Americans taking out payday loans every year. So we think this is actually something that will have a profound impact on employees' personal finances. Now, in terms of growing the business, the cost of acquiring small businesses is not small. And that's part of what brought Zenefits down. And then the cost of acquiring bigger enterprises is even bigger. How do you keep those costs in check? So we're focusing on small business, and for us, that means mostly word of mouth. We have to build a great product, a great experience. Today, we now serve over 1% of all employers in America, and a lot of that's based on people's word of mouth. So that's really our biggest way of growth. Is a goal to get larger businesses? Um, for the next several years, we're just very focused on 1 to 100 employees. That's a third of the workforce. That's 98% of the companies in America. And so we really love serving that segment. So I was trying to track your progress versus benefits, and I noticed online they still market themselves as the number one in HR software. Um, are they? <laughs> I mean, I can point to what we're doing. We now have over 60,000 clients. If you look at anyone's websites or details, definitely that's the largest of anyone out there that's in the newer crop of companies. Now, ADP and Paychex are bigger. They have about 10% market share. But the truth is, pen and paper still has 40, 50% market share. So our focus is on getting a lot of those folks that are small businesses using a manual process onto a system like Gusto. Um, it, is any of the work that you're doing involving pay equity? Like, can you track pay equity? There's a lot of talk about how, you know, diversity and equality can potentially be built into HR systems so mm -hmm. things don't get uneven. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're thinking about? Definitely. So we have a lot of product design engineers on our team thinking about that moment on Gusto when you set compensation across your whole team, what thought process, what ideas go into that. So nothing to announce today, but that is an active area of focus for us. Do you think that AI solutions are really possible um, when it comes to you know, equality and, and building diversity in the workforce, or is it, is it on personnel? 
Um, I think, yeah, technology can be used, whether it's AI or others, as a tool. But ultimately, people still have to make these decisions on what type of culture, what type of value system do you have. And frankly, you know, people really haven't had great tools before. They have, haven't had access to the data. And part of our job is to equip them with that. Now, you were last on the show sort of at the height of the Zenefits scandal and very much positioning Gusto as sort of the anti-Zenefits and, and talking about how focused you are on culture. I mean, so much has happened mm -hmm. since then. You know, what are you doing at the company to make sure, you know, problems don't arise when it comes to the culture that you're building? I mean, for us, it's for the last six years since we started the company, we plan to do this for decades. It's just been focusing on the customer and staying authentic to our values. Like, we try to avoid the echo chamber that sometimes crops up in Silicon Valley. And just, again, a, a small business owner, a bakery shop in Oklahoma City just wants to know who's going to pay their taxes on time, who's going to set up health insurance. We now do a lot of health insurance through Gusto. And that's really been what's differentiated us. I stumbled upon something interesting at Gusto, which is that people walk around barefoot. Is that yeah, true? That is true. <laughs> but it's like a thing, like you make people take their shoes off. So we have some unique traditions. These are not things we expect our customers to do, per se. But we started the company in a house in Palo Alto. And three founders, we were all raised in our homes to take our shoes off. And so that just became a tradition that organically became then a default. And so yes, today, 600 people in our Denver and San Francisco office, we take our shoes off. Everyone takes their shoes off. Everyone Billion takes their shoes company, off. Billion-dollar company, everybody takes we their shoes off. We have shoe racks. We have slippers, socks. Um, it's authentic to us. Is it? It could, isn't it a little bit of a liability? What if someone steps on something? You're an HR company. Um, it definitely is something that we've looked into. And um, we have really comfortable floors. We have carpets. Uh, you know, it's, it's a cultural thing. I think on culture, companies should be opinionated and stay true to their values. This is one that we care about. All right, well, I'm from Hawaii. Everybody takes off their shoes there. So I, I understand. Josh Reeves, CEO of Gusto, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. BlackBerry shares plunged the most in a year as software revenues fell 18% from a year earlier. The company blamed the drop on a change in accounting standards. CEO John Chen has been banking on new security software products to turn around BlackBerry's fortunes. The company has also transitioned from clients paying up front to a subscription model. Speaking on Bloomberg Television, Chen says the company's turnaround is already complete despite this fall in software sales. We will do some investment and to expand our business and geographically and, and vertically. So, um, you know, the company itself is now saved. Um, and, um, and now we're going to have to make it interesting. Coming up, Brian Grzanich is out as CEO of Intel. Did this just become corporate America's biggest Me Too moment? We will discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Intel is looking for a new leader after the chip giant ousted CEO Brian Krasanich on Thursday for having an inappropriate relationship with an Intel employee. Well, a new name has been thrown into the mix to fill that top spot. According to New Street Research, VMware CEO Pat Gelsinger would be an ideal external candidate. Remember that Gelsinger was previously CTO of Intel. No matter who Intel chooses, my next guest thinks that while Krasanich's affair doesn't compare to the transgressions of Harvey Weinstein or Steve Wynn, this scandal is corporate America's biggest Me Too moment yet. She's written all about it in her latest Bloomberg Opinion piece, Shira Oviday. Welcome. So certainly an executive having an affair with someone at the company um, is nothing new, but does this draw a new line in terms of what is and is not acceptable and what will and will not be overlooked? I think it does. And, and you're right that, you know, having consensual relationships with employees is not new for corporate executives. The office romance is kind of a, you know, an American institution. Bill Gates famously, you know, dated and married a Microsoft employee. But I do think things are different now that the scrutiny is on uh, everyone, frankly, including in corporate America, in this kind of post Me Too movement, that everybody's behavior has to be above reproach. And Intel's board, you know, they had no choice. There was a policy at the company that managers could not date subordinates. And if you're the CEO of the company, uh, basically everybody is a subordinate. So I, I, I assume that uh, BK knew those rules. You know, 
thinking about the names that have been thrown out there, Pat Gelsinger, as I mentioned, also Renee James, former Intel president who actually pitched um, with BK, as he is called. Um, they, they pitched together to become CEO and president, but she didn't last very long. Also, Stacey, Stacey Smith, um, who worked at Intel for many, many years and you know recently left the company. Then there are some other names, Lisa Su, the CEO of AMD, Diane Green, who's running Google Cloud, Diane Bryant, who was CTO at Intel for a time and is now working for Diane Green at Google. How do these names strike you? So the, a couple things strike me. Those are all highly qualified people. Um, but it's interesting that all of those people are outsiders, that Intel was a company that in its 50-year history has never had an outsider CEO. And this is a company, though, that in the last five years under Brian Krasanich, that the bench has been thinned out a little bit in part because you know, he may not have made room for strong executives uh, in the layer underneath him. So, you know, the fact that we're talking about outsiders, former Intel executives who are now elsewhere as potential CEOs, it's a pretty stunning thing for one of Silicon Valley's um, iconic companies that is always hired from within. Right. And it is also interesting that many of these Intel veterans left, you know, after he became CEO and, and and clearly the bench at this point isn't as strong as it might have been a decade ago. Definitely, it was it, it was a stronger bench even five years ago when Krasanich got the CEO job. And as you said, right, some of those people like Renee James were in the running for the CEO post and didn't get it. So maybe it's not so surprising that they didn't stick around. But at the same time, there have been some high profile departures in the last um, five years at Intel. And again, those were folks who could have been groomed to be the next CEO. So it does feel a little bit like uh, that was a miss on Intel. To Intel's part that it let so many people go and maybe they just couldn't be at the same company with Krasanich. She didn't make room for them. Quickly, Shira, how do you think this Me Too moment will affect the broader Me Too movement? It's a good question. I, I don't have a good sense of whether the rest of the world pays attention to you know executives of, of tech companies. Um, but I, I do think that broadly in corporate America, there is now this clear message that behavior has to be above reproach. All right, Bloomberg Shira Ovide, thank you so much for joining us. That is all for now. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. We'll be back on Monday. This is Bloomberg.